Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the program. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Denisovans and uh, these uh, this new discovery that they found in Tibet. And this is a really interesting story, not just about the information that we've extracted from this discovery, but also how it, it came about. Whenever you t you're talking about uh, Chinese uh, uh, Chinese academics or Chinese excavators or uh, Chinese PhDs or archaeologists, they, they hold a lot of information close to the vest. And that's why a lot of the discoveries um, that I know are really, really, uh, we kind of get this slow trickle down effect when, uh, here in the States and um, other parts of the West. There's not as much lag. I guess. That's the best way I can explain it. There's like some lag. There's a lot of um, information, much like the Vatican, that's heavily rumored to to exist in, in the hands of the Chinese. And they're sitting on a lot of artifacts, um, a lot of information that's yet to be uh, either studied or maybe they've already been studied, but the results are being withheld. But they really, uh, like I said earlier, they, they hold that information close to the vest. So um, this is one of those instances where uh, we get an international team that has the privilege enough to study this, uh, this skull and these, um, these are actually a jawbone fragment and some teeth. And uh, they're able to come away with uh, sharing this information to, um, and publishing it on stuff like Nature magazine. So um, let's just uh, dig right into it. So, so they they found this jawbone, and this Tibetan monk found it, and they dated it to about 160,000 years ago. I did a video about uh, the Denisovans crossing the Tibetan plateau. Somehow, uh, they migrated past the plateau, and some of them stayed because they know that they stayed because they had some tools, and there were some. Um, uh, animal bones with um, some uh, human-made uh, uh, marks, but those a uh, group of them, at the very least, kept going down into the south, like the South China, Southeast Asia, South China Seas area, into Taiwan, the Philippines, and and Indonesia and such. And that was one of the theories I was talking about my in one of the past videos that you guys can look up. Um, but this. Uh, this specifically is very interesting. So, what the the thing in question is called the Jahe the Jahu mandible, which was found in 1980 in Baishia Karst Cave, which is in a high elevation cave. The this Tibetan this Tibetan monk found it in uh, about 30 years ago, and then he gave it to the sixth living Buddha, which is I think the reincarnation. It's kind of like the Dalai Lama. Uh, they have a few of these ancient souls that they they believe reincarnate um every every 80 years or so and uh whenever he dies another uh, he he or she gets reborn so this this is the sixth one who held it there he was a holy man and then eventually he passed it on to scientists um that that's very interesting and then nine years ago they just started so they had just started studying it so they were again this is what i'm talking about whether it's a holy man like this, or a monk, or or even an academic, or a government official, whoever it is, a lot of stuff is locked away and kept, either either deliberately or not, is kept a secret until um, some uh, somebody decides to drum up the whatever it is courage or the wherewithal to go and request uh, to, to study said artifact. So. Jean-Jacques Kublin, he's from the Max Planck Institute from Germany, and he's part of this Chinese and European team. And oftentimes, if we're going to hear about anything, these teams have to be an international team. It's not just the Chinese team. Although there are a few things that get um, reported from an all-Chinese team, research team, but for the most part, breakthrough stuff like this is from an uh, international team. So uh, Jean-Jacques, he says, the spe specimen is much more complete than anything else we know in the Denisova cave. So uh, right away, this evidence is head and shoulders above anything they found in, in Siberia. So that makes it all, all the more compelling and all the more prudent to get as much genetic information, uh, radiocarbon dating, whatever it is that we need to get 
and we did get a lot of information. Um, it's the first time that Denisovans are ident identified far away from the Denisova cave. Now, in my previous vi video, the only thing that they found in Tibet, on the Tibetan plateau, up, up until this, was tools, these distinct tools that were different from the tools in China near the Yellow River. And um, that was one clue, and the other one was, like I said earlier, the, the bones. There was obvious, obvious uh, hunting going on up there, um, uh, done not just by an animal, but uh, a pretty advanced uh, human, which uh, led a lot of, at the time, it was a rogue opinion to say that this might be either the work of a Neanderthal or a Denisovan or some advanced human. Um, and it seems like they're exonerated now. So, so we have this bone, the lower jaw or the mandible, and then a couple of teeth. And this is 11,000 feet up in the plateau. So this is very, very high elevation. It takes a very special type of uh, human to live up there. And they, and they need this gene, this high elevation um, gene to successfully adapt to the environment up there. And we'll get into that in a second. Um, so... The archaic humans successfully adapted to high altitude, low oxygen environments long before the regional arrival of modern Homo sapiens. So, um, if th they were pretty sure that there there were Homo sapiens living up there, no doubt about it. Like the ancient Tibetans, the precursor to the Tibetans. But even before then, there was a, Den a Denisovan living up there. Now. A lot of people will ask this question. If that's true, then what's the difference between a Denisovan and a Homo sapiens? Like, isn't it just because they find this high altitude, low oxygen gene in the Tibetans living there now? So there's an obvious connection, and it, there it's obvious that Denisov a Denisovan population and a, and a Homo sapiens population were getting it on, and we in the their ancestors, their descendants, yeah, their descendants. Um, inherited that gene which exists today so there was definitely something going on up there and it's without a doubt that Denisovans were mating with homo sapiens and probably neanderthals and other Denisovans as well um, she, she also notes that there were tools and animal bones bearing cut marks in the cave it means that they likely lived there for a while which is uh, in my last video I talked about that if they, it's not like they this happens randomly i mean this must have been part of a larger picture of like a culture and uh, rule built-in societal rules and all that stuff it wasn't just some um, happenstance thing uh, one of the genes we've inherited and is common among tibetans gives people the ability to live at very high altitudes with low oxygen uh, levels already already mentioned that um, this is the team who was excavating here last year and you can see that yeah there's a lot of stuff to go through and i mean it looks like a lot of nothing right here but th it's really meticulous stuff um and it's only a matter of time before they find something else uh so the jaw is 160,000 years old they developed a low oxygen trait that passed on to humans um it's in the modern gene human gene pool because of interbreeding with denisovans that's that's matt matthew to he's we've talked about him before he's from canada uh, he's he's uh, a pretty big high authority as far as identifying Denny Sobins goes and um, now he's basically pointing out that you can connect the dots between between uh, Tibet the Tibetan Plateau and Siberia so let's just take a look at the map you can't see Siberia but it's north of here so here's the Tibetan Plateau and you can see that there is it would be feasible that they would uh, come to the Tibetan Plateau from Siberia for whatever reason. It could be an, uh, probably an environmental reason, obviously. Uh, maybe there's uh, uh, the climate shifted somehow, or maybe there's seismic activity, maybe an asteroidal impact. Who knows why? But the fact is that we see there were a lot of Denisovans in Siberia and some in uh, the Tibetan Plateau. And then... If you go further down, this is why they think that there, there was some sort of migration is because they found the same genetic markers in people in Southeast Asia, specifically Taiwan and um, the Philippines and and um, uh, Samoa and, and, and uh, other Melanesian people. So it's very, very interesting stuff. Um, 
the main river of the human lineage was split into numerous tributaries. So uh, if you think about it, it's not it's not like Homo erectus or Homo habilis and then Homo erectus. It's not like a linear progression of human evolution. It's more like we there are a bunch of humans who had a common ancestor and they all branched out and had their own adaptations only to come back and interbreed with each other yet again. So that's how um, it's like a weird uh, natural way for us to gain uh, advantageous genes such as this high lo um, this high altitude uh, low oxygen gene. Very interesting stuff. And then there's other genes too like bone density, um, how uh, muscles distributed across your body, um, white blood cells, and then there's stuff that's um, uh, the opposite like sickle cell anemia. And these are just examples of these different adaptations depending on the environment. Um, so so uh, melanin, the skin is another one. Uh, and then the article talks about Homo floresiensis, the hobbit people who lived as recently as 50,000 years ago. I did an episode on that uh, like a week ago or so. Um, and it's very important to understand that this isn't just... By the way, this is uh, this is the Ganja Basin. This is where they found, I think this is where the Tibetan monk found uh, the mandible in the cave 30 or some odd years ago. Um, but it's important that we, we understand the difference between evolution and adaptation. Um, evolution would be like we, we this, uh, like there would be a missing link between each progression. So, so fish to a mammal fish hybrid to uh, uh, um, like an ape a mammal or like a rodent and the mammal hybrid, it, you would see all these missing links everywhere. But the main criticism is we don't see any of these mi missing links. W but we do see these adaptations and specifically these genes that encode these adaptations. And uh, if, if we could map that, then we could see or we could, uh, I guess we can uh, construe where these genes came from which like so which environments they would have come from um if uh like for example uh skin skin color is a, a good one and that's an adaptation um but it, it doesn't it, it it those genes don't dehumanize you in a sense to where you can't breed with humans again we can all breed with each other all humans can breed with each other no matter how tall you are or uh, how fat you are, your color of your skin. A Tibetan can mate with someone with an African and still have a viable baby. So that's a huge clue into placing, uh, especially Homo sapiens, into this weird mosaic of of humanity that's lived on Earth for so many uh, diff uh, millions of years, probably. So um, that's going to be. That's, a, that's going to be a heated discussion for many generations, I think. I don't think we're going to hammer it out unless we find some smoking gun evidence. And maybe not just one piece of smoking gun evidence. There's, got, there's probably got to be a series of smoking gun evidence. Um, but anyway, th I thought this was a really interesting uh, uh, article, guys. The, Tibet's such a mysterious place. Um, I would love to go there uh, if I could. Um, it's just high elevation that the Him the Himalayas are just there there's probably so much stuff in there that if if I was an archaeologist that would probably be that in South America would probably be the two places I'd want to uh, dig and see what was going on and if like anything outside of uh, stuff underwater I mean if I was a marine archaeologist I'd definitely want to check out the Azores for sure ju just to see uh what what exactly was going on down there but anyway let me know what you guys think um i love i love covering this part of the world it's really interesting and anything denny sylvan's it's just anything that comes out and we're gonna have this steady stream of stuff coming out it's just fascinating and it adds so much to the to the puzzle i mean i started this channel almost a year ago and what we know about denny sylvan's now compared to then is just completely different the picture is so different i mean you guys can go back and look at the videos and compare it to this one and 
And we didn't have any of this knowledge. And the crazy thing about it is they were sitting on this for 30 years plus. So who knows what else they're sitting on? The Vatican's a big one too. There's probably a lot of stuff in the Vatican that we don't know about. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, let me know what you guys think and I'll talk to you guys later.